quick. Think of a motion-based racing controller. Most of you probably thought of the Wii wheel. Maybe even the Labo wheel. Maybe some of you even thought of my body with the Xbox, you are the controller connect. Yeah, motion-based controllers are decently common now, but one specifically made for racing? Not as much, but it kind of makes sense why. The overlap between people who'd pay extra for a racing controller and people who enjoy motion controls is pretty damn small. But just because it was a small niche doesn't mean motion-based racing controllers don't exist. This is the Performer Air Racer, released for the PlayStation 1 and the Nintendo 64 that lets you tilt the controller in place of using the analog stick. Was this just another wild gimmick controller made purely for the novelty? Or was it literally and figuratively ahead of its time and beat those other controllers to the punch? Let's find out. Fitting its name, the Air Racer controller is shaped like a W yoke, which is a pretty smart idea since both airplane and race car wheels can have this design. I guess they couldn't really figure out how to accommodate the bike handle or the snowboard shape though. The cable splits into two ends, a PlayStation plug and a 4-pin DIN input. You plug in the PlayStation end into a PlayStation if you want to use it with that, and if you want to use this with the Nintendo 64, you plug in an adapter into the PlayStation plug and you plug that into the Nintendo 64. And just in case you're curious, this adapter does not work with the regular PlayStation controller. What a bummer. It would have been way cool. So what does this other plug do? It looks like it'd be for an old PC, but it's actually where you plug in pedals if you want a more realistic driving experience. Unfortunately, I don't have a Performer Pro pedal, so I can't test this out. Sorry about that. I'm just not pro enough. The center of the controller has a select, start, and set button. The set button lets you choose which type of PlayStation controller you want to emulate and adjust a bunch of other different settings. This is shown on the back of the controller, and it says you can choose among three controller options. The Namco Nijikon, a PlayStation DualShock, or the PlayStation Digital Controller. You can also turn the tilting input on or off if you want to use just the buttons, but at that point just use the official controllers. One thing I'm curious about is how are you going to use the second analog stick if you're using this thing in DualShock mode? Tilting can only control the left stick, and there are some racing games that can use both analog sticks after all, so this isn't even a nitpicky point. Get this, you have to use this tiny dial below the face buttons for vertical movements, and these two buttons on the back for horizontal movements. The knob is so tiny it feels like you're using a toothpick, it hurts my thumb. Not to mention, having buttons to control the horizontal inputs means you're locked to going either all the way left or all the way right, no in between. And this tries to simulate the Nijikon controller where you'd have to twist the controller to steer, but twisting the air racer does nothing. It does however allow you to use that toothpick as the analog gas and brake inputs of the Nijikon buttons. The left side of the controller has a shield d-pad and two buttons which acts as the L and R buttons on the N64, L1 and L2 on the PlayStation, and 2 and B on the Nijikon. The right side of the controller there are 6 buttons, which acts as the A, B, and C buttons on the N64, R1, R2, and the face buttons on the PlayStation, and the 1 and A buttons on the Nijikon. And because I bought this new, the buttons are clicky and feel really nice to press. Beneath the buttons is the dial used to control the vertical inputs on the right analog stick. Now, I was really curious how the analog inputs worked on this, so I took it apart. It turns out, it uses the same type of mechanism on an official N64 controller. There are two sets of spinning wheels with a series of slots on them. On an OEM N64 controller, these wheels would rotate with the analog stick. But on the Air Racer, there are weights at the bottom of each of these wheels, which helps them to rotate along with the rotation of the controller. When these wheels rotate, optical sensors would be able to count how frequently and how long they had a clear line of sight, which it then uses to give those analog values. If it counts that many slots passed by, that means the stick is tilted far, and if it doesn't count as many slots, that means the stick is tilted only a little bit. It was a good workaround for a time when modern potentiometers were expensive to produce, but it still wasn't perfect. For example, there was no way to tell just from these slots the position of the stick. This is why the console just assumes the stick is centered when it first boots up. It can only tell relative position, not absolute position. Imagine this problem on a controller whose analog wheels don't have springs in them and thus don't automatically go back to the neutral position. It's pretty bad. You have to make sure the controller is at the correct upright position when you turn the console on, and even if you do that, it can still get uncalibrated really easily if you tilt the controller too fast. So I have some doubts whether this controller would even function well, but I can't say anything without trying it first. So let's get to it. So the box for the Air Racer boasts that it rules with flight, fighting, racing, boating, fighting, testing, road rally, jet fighters, motorcycles, helicopters, auto racing, tank combat, space fighters, snowboarding, skateboarding, action adventure, even more. Let's go through some of the less notable ones in a lightning round and talk about the more important genres in detail. Starting with biking. I'd have an easier time riding a unicycle while drunk. Boating. 
Honestly, not too bad. I expect boats to have a really weighty handling, so the input lag from when I turned the wheel and the game responding didn't really affect the gameplay too much. Fighting. It's terrible. I don't even know why they advertise this to work with fighting games. It's probably easier to play this with a DDR pad. In fact, I did and can confirm. It's easier. Jet Ski. Has a similar problem to Paperboy where the steering is too sensitive and I keep moving side to side because I overcorrect my turns. Motorcycles. Not too bad, but I feel like I'm not getting the full turn on the racing wheel. Helicopters. It's so hard to aim down at enemies on the ground because the up and down movement is really janky. Tank combat. Not the worst, you just have to remember to tilt the controller side to side rather than in a steering motion. Snowboarding. Pulling off a 1080 was hard enough, good luck with this controller. Skateboarding. I mean, technically it works, but you don't even use the tilt function of the controller, so like I said earlier, if you're not going to use the main gimmick of the controller, you might as well just use the OEM controller. Action Adventure Again, I don't know why they're trying to say this controller is good with all these different genres. It just sets people up for disappointment. They should have just stuck with racing and flying games. Now that that's out of the way, let's get to the real meat and potatoes, starting with some racing games. I have Ridge Racer 64, Colin McRae Rally, and Gran Turismo 2. I first tried this out with Ridge Racer, which is a pretty fast-paced arcade-style racer, and already my concerns are proving to be valid. Anytime you try to steer really quickly, or you steer back and forth, the sensor wheels I mentioned earlier oscillate like a pendulum and you'll most likely mess up your turns. And there's a lot of input lag because of the time it takes for the weight to spin the wheel into position after you steer. That pesky inertia. These issues aren't too pronounced if your game doesn't require to turn fast nor alternate the steering too frequently, but it still just ends up being a handicap. Now let's see if the Air Racer is airworthy with Star Fox 64 and Star Wars Rogue Squadron. As if input lag in a racing game wasn't bad enough, now I have to dodge lasers and fly up and down. And once again, the vertical movements are way too unresponsive. I suspect it has to do with the vertical sensor wheel being smaller, thus being less precise than the horizontal sensor wheel. It turns these amazing and fun games into frustrating messes. Hey man, that's not cool. The advertising on the box claims that using the air racer would make games more exciting, and just look at this guy having the time of his life. But I just didn't have the same experience. I love the completely analog mechanism, but it just doesn't function that well without a proper gyroscope or accelerometer. Anytime I tried to use the controller even half as intensely as this guy, the sensor wheels would swing back and forth and mess me up in the games. So to answer my question in the beginning, this thing wasn't ahead of its time. I think the Wii really did revolutionize motion controls. It's a shame because if they just put a little bit more development time into this and made the mechanism more reliable, they could have released it for the GameCube instead. Can you imagine playing Super Monkey Ball with this controller? Uh, on second thought, maybe we should keep motion controls as far away from the Monkey Ball series as possible. So that's the Air Racer, just a gimmicky controller I'd only ever use for the novelty. And even then, the novelty just isn't that interesting. Sad to say, I don't think I'd ever be using this controller again. I'm gonna go throw this thing out. Thanks for watching everyone. All that's left to do now is drive.